a, a massive conversation going on. It's been actually the case for about the last uh, two or three years where online film criticism seems to be leeching away from conventional uh, paper and out print based and, and broadcast based. And where do you see film criticism taking place in, in, the, in the main conversation? Because are people even sh paying attention to what film critics are saying nowadays? Well, there, that's a good question because there are probably now more film critics than ever. And the question becomes, how do you build a constituency? It used to be that you look to a film critic to tell you about something you didn't know and maybe to inform you. And I think now it's narrow casting. It's you find the music you like, you listen to nothing but that. You find the film critic you like and read nothing but that. And maybe the danger in that is you don't get exposed to stuff you would never know about. Does the passion for film replace the knowledge for film? I think everybody does this. I mean, nobody's doing this because they make money at it, for God's sake. You're doing it because you uh, you love film and you want to let people know what you think. And you know what great criticism is about? It's, it's people trying to disentangle what the artists are doing and maybe helping them understand what it is. You know, George Bernard Shaw, Pauline Kael, I mean, people like that. I mean, I wonder if that next generation of film critics is now just going into making films themselves. I mean, because for a lot of critics and a lot of people, it was kind of a way station. You're here tonight uh, leading the conversation with John Lithgow. What is your first memory of John on screen? Seeing him in his uh, obsession, um, the sort of baby face, it seemed like he was the salt of the earth and turned out he was the salt in your wound. And it was a, and it paid attention to him ever since and looked forward to him after that. He did three movies with Brian De Palma. You know, he did Obsession, then he did Blowout, and, and then he did uh, Raising Cain, and they're all, but just following him in everything, and getting, even getting a chance to see him on stage, he's just somebody I look forward to. And this is your second Art of Film event, last year obviously with Robert Duvall. Are you going to become our conversation emeritus? <laughs> I, I'll go, I'm happy to come back here, I, I, if only because downtown seems to be literally a different place every time I come back here. Uh, it's like there's going to be no history left in downtown. I expect it to look like the Jetsons when I come back here next year. You're in town this week for... Twilight Breaking Dawn Part 1, and this is actually going to be, you know, online after the event when everybody has a chance to see the film, but everyone is talking about that scene with the Volteri at the end of the flick. When Condon comes to you and says, you're going to be the Easter egg at the end of the movie, what was your reaction? <laughs> well, you know, Bill Condon is an Oscar award winning you know, director, so obviously it was just so intense to, to just be there with him. And, uh, you know, of course, every actor wants to do, no matter what level you're at, you want to do well for such a, an amazing director like that. So it was just a thrilling experience. The uh, set was just so real to what you actually see. It was huge and, and uh, beautiful. So, yeah, it was absolutely wonderful. Have you had a chance to interact with very many Twilight fans um, over, over the course of, you know, putting this film together with the capper for the big saga? Well, I was at the premiere in L.A. on Monday night, and of course the fans were just insane. And what's amazing about it is it, the fans are just they are very loyal, and this is my first uh, Twilight to be a part of. Um, and even though I'm a support role, they still are just, you know, so welcoming and embracing. They just love the whole project, so anyone that's a part of it, they're very welcoming of. So, yeah, they're, they're, uh, they're very intense fans, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> So um, obviously we find out what happens to you next November when the film comes out. Are you, are, are, how, are you enjoying the whole process of being part of this phenomenon? It's, it's amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely the biggest film out right now. So it's, it's just great to be a part of something that can reach you know, a wide audience. It's always, it's always very, a, a great blessing for a career. So. And your flick's going to make $150 million bucks this weekend at the box office. So it's not a bad thing to have in your cap. Absolutely, absolutely. Let's hope I get a nice little chunk of that, right? You took the points, right? You took the points. Yeah. Tell me you took the points. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> The man of the evening, the man of the weekend, actually, because we've got a lot of stuff uh, planned for you this weekend as well at the Angelica Theater. First off, John, thank you for coming to Dallas, and thanks for hanging out with the Art of Filming this year. Oh, I'm delighted. It's, I feel so honored to be here. It's great. 
It's been a really great year for you personally. Not only a, a fantastic turn um, uh, last year with the, the previous season of Dexter, but this year with Drama and Actors Journey. I've spoken to several actors who some of them have no qualms with uh, doing a memoir. Some of them who do because they're afraid that if they give away some of their own internal motivation, they'll wind up giving away a piece of themselves in their performance as well. Did you have any uh, discussions with yourself um, when you were preparing to do the book? Well, I, I was ambivalent about a few things, but not that kind of thing. I enjoyed talking about acting, and in a sense, I felt like I was talking to young actors a lot of the time. But mainly, there was a story about me, my, my the various stages of my education. It's only about the first half of my life. It ends in 1980 when I was 35. And probably the most important element of it is it's a tribute to my father and everything I've I learn from him either directly or by osmosis. Uh, there's a phenomenal passage in the book where you're speaking about reading to your father in one of the final moments of his life. And in a fantastic book overall, how emotional was that for you to actually either dictate that or put that on paper for the first time? Extremely emotional. Actually, I don't think the, memo, the memoir ever would have happened if it hadn't been for that moment with my dad. He was 88. I was about... 56, I think, I was taking care of him as an old man. And uh, he was a man of the theater. Uh, I grew up doing Shakespeare for my dad. Uh, and it was just such an intense moment where it just kind of crystallized everything I think and feel about what I do. And that was the jumping off point for creating my one man show, which was very much about that. The memoir grew right out of the one man show. Stage, screen, TV, is there one medium that you prefer to work in or is it just, you know, I, I want to work in everything that I possibly can? I love them all. I, I, mainly I love working with great people in all these different media. I sort of self-identify as a theater actor just because that's what I, that's the world I grew up in and a, the world I keep returning to. And I do feel that everything I contribute to movies and TV is... The equipment, uh, my bag of tricks that I've gradually amassed on stage. But I just love them all. They're very different disciplines, and I like variety to me is the spice of life. Absolutely. Well, I'm not going to ask you any more questions because I'm sure Elvis Mitchell has a ton of them for you. Thank you for coming to Dallas. Okay. Enjoy your stay here. Really Great. appreciate it.